Hi, this is Kim Hutchinson. Welcome to our training session, Labeling with Sarah Sharp, the Ag Agent from Greene County for the Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm Kim Hutchinson with the Virginia Farmers Market Association and we are thrilled to have you guys join us for our Lunch and Learn series. The Virginia Farmers Market Association the Virginia Farmers Market Association is a statewide association working with farmers markets across the state of Virginia to make sure that they are sustainable, that they have the tools and resources that they need in order to continue to provide the amazing bounty that is Virginia's um, uh, beautiful produce, fruits, vegetables, and crafts that are showcased at our markets. The one piece of information that we have received from you repeatedly is that we need to be able to provide is that we need to be able to provide for you training and education programs on an ongoing basis in order to help shore up your tools. And so that's what's brought us to this meeting today. Um, I want to thank you for, um, shout out, uh, thank you to the Extension for doing this Lunch and Learn series for us. And I highly encourage all of you to please participate in our conference that is November 13th, 14th, and 15th in Stanton, Virginia, where we will be doing more training. At this time, I will turn it over to Sarah. Sarah? Great. I'm so glad to have everyone here today. Um, as Kim said, I am Sarah Sharp, and I am the Ag Agent based in Greene County. I was on two weeks ago talking about identifying a market, and today I'm going to talk a little more about labeling and labeling requirements going to hope that it goes through. There we go. All right. So first off, this is just kind of to preface this whole conversation. Um, it's just that I am not an expert on labeling laws and regulations. This is one that people call me with questions about labeling all the time, and I'm happy to give some pretty basic information, but I tell people that with really specific questions, um, it's best to go to VDAX or VDH, depending on which outfit you need to talk to. And just that this is really just for educational purposes to kind of help you start thinking through if you are looking at making sure that you do have the correct information on your label, making sure that you are labeling um, appropriately and as needed. So to start out, as we look at this, we have to think about there are just some basic label requirements that we need to make sure that we have on any of our products. The first thing that we need to think about, and this is an example, I pulled this information directly from the VDAX website, and they use this picture up here as their example. So you have to have the product name on there. It needs to be on the front panel. There should be an accurate description. So when we see chocolate chip cookies at the top, it's pretty universal that we should know exactly what it is that we're getting ready to eat or buy. In bold print, and it should be the largest type on the label so that it really stands out. We need to make sure that we have the net weight in both standard and metric units on that label. As you can see here, this says it's in 10 ounces or 283 grams, which means that yes, you do need to have a scale um, if you are going to be labeling anything like this. We have to have the name and address of the manufacturer, distributor, or packer. So if you are making this in your kitchen, you'd wanna make sure that you have some sort of contact address, contact information on the label that people can get in touch with you. And for some, depending on how big your business is, and we'll talk about this, we may need some nutritional labeling information. However, for small businesses, there is an exemption that you can apply for and get. So when we think about ingredients, they should again be on the front panel so that people can see it or directly to the right of the front panel. So if we think about a normal, you know, a jar of peanut butter, because that's what I have on my desk right here. So if we pick it up, we have the name of it is so that we can see it. And then just to the right of that, we have the ingredients so that we can see, you know, exactly what it is. So it needs to be very accessible so that people can see exactly what it is 
that they're getting ready to eat. And we have to include all of the ingredients in descending order, basically from, from biggest to smallest by weight. So, and they also must be broken down to the smallest sub ingredients. So as you can see here, we have semi-sweet chocolate chips in our chocolate chip cookies and the ingredients of those chocolate chips are broken down so that they are in the label. We also have to include allergens. If you are, if you have something that may have an allergen in it, we need to make sure that is on the label as well. So we need to include the most common allergens, which are milk, wheat, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, soybeans, fish, and crustaceans, shellfish on our label if we are including anything like that in any of our products. So then we go to our nutritional labeling exemption. This is the important part if you are doing any of this because you can apply for an exemption. So if you have annual gross sales of less than $500,000 or annual gross sales to food consumers of less than $50,000, you also have less than 100 employees and products. So you sell less than 100,000 units of your products then you can file for an exemption. If you have, if you're even smaller than that, looking at your less than 10 employees and less than 10,000 units sold, you don't need to file an exemption. However, and of course there's a however to all of this, if a label makes a nutrient content claim of any kind, which we will talk about a little later on, you no longer qualify for that exemption because then you have to add in a nutrition label and, and all that. Um, however, you still have to list that mandatory labeling information. And so that's those basic label requirements in the first two slides. So then we think about if we are doing home production or production in an uninspected kitchen, and this is where, again, things start getting really gray. And if you have really specific questions is where VDAX is a great resource for you. If you have an uninspected kitchen, you have to make sure that you have not for resale processed and prepared without state inspection on that label. It must be in all caps, just like I have the example here on the screen. This is really important. And so here's where we already start getting into discrepancies. So if you look on the VDAX website and their publication, um, this is not listed, but if you look in the Going to Market VCE Pub, that's a wonderful resource. They state that we also need to list the contact information of the person preparing the food other than the physical address and the date the food was processed. So this is important for multiple reasons. So if you have some, and this can be a marketing, you, you can look at this at a marketing aspect too. So that if you are, let's say, at a farmer's market, it's a really big farmer's market, you're a new vendor there, you can go in and you can actually, right. So I see somebody just commented as market manager, I keep a sheet or two of these pre-printed labels with that statement with me at the market for vendor use, an example. Yes, that is so important. And I'm so glad that you are going around and keeping an eye on that because there are some markets that may not do that. And this just helps keep everybody safe, just making sure that we know that we can't resell it and that it was processed and prepared without state inspection. Um, so going back to thinking about if you have all of your contact information on that label, this is a great way for somebody who may have just tried your product for the first time to, to get a hold of you and be able to find you in the future. As far as the date the food was processed, um, that can be really great for your use, especially if you may not sell all of your for example, baked goods at one time um, in one day and you take some of it home, stick it in the freezer, this can help you with your just being able to keep track of everything that you're selling as well so that you know exactly 
when it was prepared so that you know what needs to get used first. You don't have to use the traditional um, month date, year date that we think about. There are a lot of people who may use a different dating method. For example, there is the dating method um, where you just count the numbers of the days of the year um, and use that. So instead of the whole month, date, year, it may just be, um, you know, day 296, and that will correlate to that appropriate day of the year. You just have to make sure that you would be familiar with that should you decide to use it. Acidified canned foods. So these must be produced in a private home. They must be sold at farmer's markets um, from the private home where it was manufactured or to an individual for their own consumption. So they cannot be sold to other businesses. They cannot be sold for resale. They cannot be sold on the internet and they cannot be sold across state lines. So if you have a Facebook page and you post your wonderful pickles um, that you just made or your hot salsa that you just made and you have someone in Iowa who may randomly have found you and wants to wants you to ship it to them for Christmas, legally you may not do that. Um, you may not exceed $3,000 in annual sales for all acidified products that you produce. So if you are making um, pickled okra and salsa and barbecue sauce and relish, um, you cannot exceed $3,000 in sales total for all of those. Should you get to that point, that's when we would need to think about going to a commercial kitchen and making sure that we have um, that better process that you work with Joelle Eifer at Virginia Tech to get all of this done properly. Um, you have to achieve a pH of 4.6 or lower, and to do that, you must purchase an electronic pH meter. Um, they can be a little expensive, but it is very important to have because getting that pH down is so essential. And it's always recommended, Virginia Tech does offer a better process control school um, that you can go to and take. And should you get above that $3,000, it is really, really important that you take that class to make sure that you are doing things correctly and making sure that people are staying safe. Looking at our baked goods and jams, which are very popular, we have to have that standard label. So going back to those basic label requirements, we need to have that on all of our products that we sell. If you are selling things that aren't prepackaged, so for example, if you are at a farmer's market and you've made scones that you sell and you hand to people using a tissue, um, we have to make sure that they are covered. We can't just have them out in a basket um, as a free-for-all. We have to protect them from environmental contaminants. And our examples here of what falls under this is looking at our jams and jellies, but they cannot have any low acid ingredients. Um, our candies, dried fruits and herbs, uncoated nuts, flavored vinegars, popcorn, cotton candy, dried pasta, roasted coffee, um, dried teas, cereals, trail mixes, granola, baked goods that don't require a time or temperature control. All right, so now moving on to thinking about honey. Um, this is one I know this is very popular. Beekeeping is getting more and more popular all the time, and so we've got to figure out what to do with our honey after we have it. So this is important. This honey must be processed and prepared from the private ed re residence of the people that own those bees from the, the hives that they own. You must sell less than 250 gallons of honey per year. And so looking at labeling, it has to include those basic label requirements. Plus it must say processed and prepared without state inspection warning do not feed honey to infants under one year old and so this little label has to be on there in that exact wording as well when we look at look at our labeling 
eggs. This is one that I thought was absolutely fascinating. Um, there is the Virginia egg law that we do have to abide by. However, if you are selling less than 150 dozen of your own eggs every week, or 60 dozen or less of another producer's eggs every week, you are exempt from that Virginia egg law. This next bullet, I think a lot of people are guilty of. I know I um, had chickens and sold eggs for many, many years and actually did not know this until I started this job, is that fresh eggs, so if you have fresh eggs anywhere on any sort of label that you are using, you may only have that on there if your products re meet that requirement for grade A grade eggs or higher, which therefore means that you have to be able to grade your own eggs. So if you are not grading your own eggs, you cannot put fresh eggs on your egg cartons. Now I think that at farmers markets, people make the assumption that if you're selling eggs, they are fresh, but I think it is good to realize that legally you cannot put fresh eggs on your eggs unless they have been graded. They have to have safe handling instructions on them. Um, they need to have grade AA, A, A, or B if they've been graded or ungraded if they haven't been inspected and graded. And we also need to just be careful. Um, I work a lot with fresh produce food safety. So food safety is something that is always in the back of my mind, but thinking about reusing egg cartons. And this is one that is hard, just as hard for me as it is um, for everybody else. And so that is, <laughs> we really wanna think about making sure that we're not reusing our egg cartons. What you can do is that you can have people bring their egg cartons back to you and you could transfer the eggs into their own egg cartons, but you don't ever want to take their egg cartons back to your house. Um, just because we never know what, could, what those egg cartons could be contaminated with. I do have a question. If you are exempt, then do you have to follow the fresh eggs rule? I do not know, but I would still be really careful because that is a legal thing. Um, I would contact VDAX to find out for sure, but I, I would just be, I think it's one, I'm not sure how much this law is really enforced. However, it's something that I do think we need to be just cognizant of and make sure that we, we do know that technically we really can't put that on our eggs. In, right, so most egg cartons that my vendors order and use have that printed on them. Again, I think it's just, it's just what is industry standard almost these days is that it says fresh eggs. That's why I say I'm not sure that this law is really um, enforced, but I think it is good to know. I mean, I don't think that any, but that is something that a VDAX inspector could come through if they ever came through your market and happened to look and see if you had somebody that was a real stickler, they may have some sort of issue with that. All right, so moving on to produce, and this one I will just touch on a little bit. Um, we'll go into a little more about this next week. So thinking about produce, if you are a produce grower, you need to make sure that you are aware of the produce safety rule and their requirements and this law. Basically, if you sell under $25,000 of produce, you are exempt. If you sell over $25,000 of produce, you will fall somewhere under the produce safety rule. You may be qualified exempt, but you do, if you sell over $25,000, you need to make sure that you understand exactly what is required of you, even if you are qualified exempt. So sprouts, hydroponic operations, and farm-raised mushrooms, as well as all of the regular produce that we think about are all considered produce under the produce safety rule. Wild mushrooms require VDAX food safety. Um, this does not, count farm-raised mushrooms. So those are two different things. And we have to think about just that 
the produce does require basic protection from contamination unless you are offering samples of cut melon, cut leafy greens, and cut tomatoes. This is because especially those cut melons, I, I don't know that we give, we, some people may give out samples of cut leafy greens, but I see more samples of cut melon and cut tomatoes that are being offered. This is really important. Melons and cut tomatoes are both time and temperature controlled for safety because they are capable of supporting the growth of various infectious microorganisms or toxins. So you wanna make sure that if you are offering these that you are keeping this produce really cold. They have to be held below 41 degrees, but you're doing a really good job of keeping them away from environmental contaminants, that you're not just putting a cutting up a melon and leaving it out in the sun um, on the outside of your tent with the rest of your bin of melons for samples. We need to make sure that you have a sample table, that you're keeping those melons cold, etc. And there are, if you do fall under the produce safety rule, if you, so if you are selling more than $25,000, there are some additional labeling requirements. For example, you do have to have a, some sort of, it's very basic, you do have to have a sign that lists the farm name as well as the contact information for that farm underneath, somewhere in your stand. Um, there is a gray area if you are buying and reselling produce. Um, we are waiting for FDA guidance as to how the labeling will require that, whether you'll be required to label all of the produce that you buy and resell, or if it will fall just under that main farm label. So that's one that we're still waiting to hear on. But again, for marketing, it's always a good idea to have a sign somewhere that everyone can see with the farm name, as well as some contact information on there. So then moving on to meat. If you are selling meat, it must be slaughtered at a USDA or state inspected facility. You must have the required components on the label, so going back to that basic label requirements, as well as the inspection legend, so that's going to be the plant that did the work, and the safe handling statement. You have to hold that meat at 41 degrees or lower, and this, the meat guidelines reply, apply to cattle, hogs, sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, guineas, emus and ostrich, and squabs. If you have rabbits, because that is another question that I get asked, there is a special Virginia rabbit program that's through the VDAC's Office of Food and Dairy, and you would want to contact them to participate in that program. And then of course, wild, harvest, wild harvested game birds and animals cannot be sold. So um, turkey or deer that you may harvest during hunting season, you cannot take those to the farmer's market and sell them. That is for that individual's use only. Poultry exemption. <laughs> this is another one that I get a lot of questions on because there is such a demand for fresh poultry. So I'm not going to go into a ton of details about this. In the follow-up email that will get sent to you, I'm going to have the full poultry exemption, well, a couple different poultry exemption um, documents in it that do a great job of going into a lot of detail on this. And I can tell you that the Office of Meat and Poultry Services is a wonderful resource if you do have, if this is something that you're thinking about getting into and you do have a lot of questions about poultry because there are a lot of exemptions that you can apply for if you are going to be doing poultry. There's a thousand bird exemption, a 20,000 bird exemption. Um, you can only sell, if you, so if you do participate in this, you can only sell it in Virginia. Basically what it is is that you can grow the chickens and then you must slaughter and process on your premises um, for distribution by you to any person. And there are a whole lot more guidelines about if you are thinking about selling to restaurants um, or some other things that are all in these great resources that will be included in the folder that I'm going to send out. 
So thinking about moving on a little bit from labeling requirements, we're gonna talk a little bit about label claims. And so on this screen is a whole list of label claims that I see or hear of on a regular basis. And so now we're gonna think about exactly what those label claims mean and how and what if they have a true definition if that's something that you should think about using etc so just some i know some of you i think are, are maybe have joined by phone so i want to make sure that i read this um, as well so some of the diff some of the ones that are out there local natural organic pasture fed grass fed grain fed antibiotic free no hormones added fresh never frozen um, and then thinking about you know we can also look at, at the produce ones and again a lot of those are very similar as well all right so also as another clarification some of these um, especially the ones that have to do with meat um, came from the USDA AMS website however as of 2016 AMS no longer has these official standards so basically before this before 2016 AMS or USDA would regulate most of these standards so they held the definitions when 2016 came around they said nope we don't think we want to do this anymore we'll let third party authorities be the ones who handle especially the definitions for grass fed and naturally raised um, and basically what that means is that it became a huge gray area and basically those companies started defining the standards for themselves so if you are going to use one of these label claims on your label and so as another point of reference this is what i'm going to talk about is if you decide to put it on your label this is what this applies to if you have a sign at your booth that says fresh pork or um, local produce this is not count to that you can put whatever you want to on a sign but if you have a label that has to go through fda or fsis and so then we have a whole lot of other rules that go into it and they have to okay what goes on that label so thinking about local this is one that i kind of laugh at a little bit because there's actually no defined definition of exactly what local is. I know there is a story that I heard that there was a request for proposal from um, USDA or a school system looking for local produce. And if you read the RFP, it said that local produce can come from 750 miles away. And so I think it's a really, we're, we're doing a big burden to some people that we don't have a good defined definition because I think that and even consumers aren't sure as to what local is local has a different definition for a lot of different people so just thinking about that when you are making that local claim you could put local up on a sign and be 300 miles away and it just depends on what people think of as local and that's where I really encourage people to make sure that they're talking to their customers that their customers understand what they're doing because a lot of times we know that the farmers market vendors are buying from that from the person from the vendor they, they're buying that story but making sure that we just kind of have this in the back of our mind that when we start thinking about local and, and seeing local claims hit places there's really no true definition as to what local really means Another one is organic, where you think that this one would be pretty black and white, but it isn't. So if you sell $5,000 or less of produce or meat, you can say, um, you can claim yourself as organic, but you must sell, you have to follow all the organic practices, but you don't have to be certified organic if you are selling less than $5,000. Organic is one that I also encourage people to really do a lot of market research on. Um, there's been some market research done that says that in this area, 
organic may not pay for itself. And again, you have to know your market and know the people that your your customer base as to whether or not organic is really important to them, or if knowing you and your growing practices is what is truly important. And basically, that's what the marketing research that I've read has found is that in this area, people are more concerned with the whole know your farmer, know your food than they are about certified organic. But if being certified organic or being organic is really important to you, if you are selling less than $5,000, you can claim organic and not have to be certified organic. Once you hit that $5,000, then you must be certified organic to, to use that claim. If you are 100% organic, that means that, you know, that can be a single ingredient, but it would mean that everything that you are using must be organic, 100% organic. You can call, you can be just organic, so not 100% organic, just organic, which means that multiple ingredients, but not necessarily all of them, um, 95 to 100% must be organic. You can say made with organic ingredients, which would mean that at least 70% organic ingredients are used. And then we can say less than 70% organic ingredients. And then if that is the case, you would just wanna include on your ingredient list where the organic ingredients are. So just a little more background about organic. So this is produced without genetic engineering, radiation, or biosolids. Anything grown organically must be managed in a way that's conserving all of your natural resources. If you are having, if you do have animals, um, if you have organic meat, the land that those animals are raised on must be certified organic. They must have year-round access to the outdoors and fed 100% organic feed. You cannot use any antibiotics, added growth hormones, mammalian or avian byproducts, or any other prohibited feed ingredients. And if you are raising ruminants, they must have free access to certified organic pasture during the entire grazing season. And their diet must contain at least 30% dry matter from certified organic pastures. And I will also include a PDF of this entire um, slideshow in my folder so that you'll have all of this information as well as these links that are in the bottom. So if any of this does interest you and is something that you do want more information on, you can have those links as references. Then we look at GMO free. Right now there is voluntary labeling um, for GMO free. Um, the FDA does recommend that if you are going to claim this, that you use terms such as not genetically engineered, not bioengineered, or not genetically modified through the use of modern biotechnology. Um, looking at GMO free, we want to make sure that we realize that there are only 10 GMO crops approved for sale in the U.S. Um, apples, potatoes, field corn, canola, alfalfa, soybean, rainbow papaya, cotton, sugar beets, sweet corn, and summer squash. So just keeping that in the back of your mind if labeling yourself as GMO free is important. And you must go through a third party verification if you want to participate in any sort of GMO free label claims. And that is the link to the FDA regulations and their guidelines about GMO free. Thinking about natural, this is another one that is very ambiguous. It really doesn't have a good definition for it. So all natural would mean that no artificial ingredients or added color is added and it is minimally processed. On that label, so if you can, if you are on a computer and you can see it on this label, it says it has the definition, which is what if you are going to, to use a claim like this that doesn't have a state like organic, we know there's a definition. GMO free is voluntary, but there's sort of a definite, there's, there's pretty much a definition there. But natural, there is no good definition for this. So on the label, we have to include what that natural means. So on this label for this bacon, 
it says no artificial ingredients or preservatives, no added steroids or hormones, product of USA. So that is their definition of natural. And as we go a little bit lower and we look at what the FDA requires, that is going to meet that definition. That's their definition. So that's allowed on the label. Um, pork enhancement is not allowed. Grass-fed does not equal natural. So moving on to grass-fed. So if you are going to look at this, and so we have this label here, um, that it's 100% organic grass-fed beef burgers, and it says on there, 100% organic, 100% grass-fed and grain-finished, and grass finished, sorry. No added hormones, no added antibiotics, pasture raised on family farms. So again, that meets that requirement because on that label, it says exactly what that definition of grass fed is. Um, they are only allowed to eat grass or hay for their entire lives, never given grain or grain byproducts. They're allowed access to pasture during the growing season, and there is no USDA standard definition. And just as a little um, point, um, all cattle are grass fed really because they are ruminants. So they have to, even if you are grain finishing them, they do have to have grass or fiber, some sort of roughage in their system for their digestive system to be able to, to digest their food appropriately. Pasture raised. This is another one where you'd have to go in and include what that definition of pasture raised means on that label if this is something that you wanted to include. So what this means is that, and there's lots of different words, so it could be free range, it could be free roaming, it could be pasture raised. Basically what it means is that livestock must have had continuous and unconfined access to pasture their entire life cycle, never confined to a feedlot, and if you have pigs, they must be given continuous access to pasture for at least 80% of their production cycle. And I think it's interesting that for pigs, when we think about this, this says nothing about what it's fed. Um, and I think that's something else. Grass fed does not mean pasture raised. So just keep that in mind as we're thinking about our label claims. Hormones, if you do want to to put on your label hormone free. Another, some other words for this that you may see are hormone or a growth promotant or a growth stimulant or an implant. Um, hormone free claims are not allowed because all animals have hormones naturally in their systems. Um, thinking about if you do, if you are raising pigs or poultry and you want to make some sort of label claim about hormones, um, number one, hormones are not allowed in raising them, so you cannot claim no hormones added unless you also say that federal regulations prohibit the use of hormones. Beef is a little different because hormone implants are allowed in beef production, so you can say no hormones administered for label claims if you have documentation that can be provided to prove that point. Chemical free is not allowed. So that is not a claim that you could make. Raised without antibiotics means that animals cannot have been given antibiotics in their feed, water, or by injections. Um, you could, some different label claims that you could say that all have to do with antibiotics would be no antibiotics administered, no antibiotics administered in the last 150 days, or raised without subtherapeutic antibiotics. However, if you are going to claim that, and this is one that you would have to, you'd have to submit this documentation with your label to be approved, we well, would have to have a detailed written description for controls to ensure that these animals are not given antibiotics ever. You would have to have a signed and dated document that would describe how these animals are raised to support these claims. You'd have to have a written description of the product tracing and segregation mechanism from time of slaughter and or further processing through packaging and sale. So basically that would be even at your processor, you would have to have a written description of what is being done there to make sure that your animals are never being crossed, that there's no chance that they would, you'd ever get any sort of product mix up. 
There'd also have to be a written description for the ID control and segregation of non-conforming animals. So for example, you may have a herd of, of beef cattle and one gets sick that you, that you have a label that says no antibiotics. One gets sick, it has pneumonia, you decide to work with the vet, you decide the antibiotics are the best course of practice for this animal. You would have to have a written description of what happens to that animal. How do you make sure that they don't go back into the herd? How do you make sure that that meat never crosses, that the meat from that animal never makes it into the same box as the meat from the animals that ne have never had antibiotics? antibiotics administered. And so all that information, you have to have it all written out, very detailed, and then submitted with your label to be approved. And this is where I'm going to go back in and remind you that this is only for if you want to have a label claim on there. So if you want to have a label like this that has the all natural, that's where this is going to come into play. Again, if you have a sign up that says all natural or antibiotic free, you would not have to conform to all of this. Again, so looking at living and raising conditions, this is going to refer to the environment in which the animals were raised. So some claims that would have to do with this is the cage or crate free, free range, non-confined, pasture raised, free roaming, pasture fed, pasture grown, meadow raised. Anything like that, um, you would have to have the definition with the claim on the label. And again, just like the antibiotics one, we'd have to have all of that very detailed application filled out and submitted with the label for approval. So nutrition label claims. So there are three different types of nutrition label claims. So one could be a nutrient claim. So that's where we think about low fat, or I, th I give an example, think about a bag of potato chips. It has the, the regular Lay's in the yellow bag, or the lower fat, um, or if you think about Chex Mix, Chex Mix says lower fat than the leading potato chip or something. So on there, you, if you make that claim, you would have to say somewhere on that label, whether it be the front or the back, um, you know, 10 grams of fat in traditional potato chips versus seven grams of fat in this Chex Mix. So if you made a nutrition claim like that, that would have to go onto your label. If you make a health claim, so that would be blackberries may reduce your risk of cancer. Um, that would be some sort of correlation between a food and a health related condition. Cheerios reduces cholesterol, for example. Um, you would have to, it would go very intense scrutiny and it must pass a review of scientific evidence. A structure or function claim. So calcium builds bo strong bones. Fiber helps keep you regular. Vitamin A protects your eyes. So a nutrient that is found in your product and what it's going to do, that physiological function in your body. You would have to submit that warning to FDA when you have the label. Um, you'd have to submit all the paperwork that goes along with it. And once you start making any sort of nutrition label claims, you must include a nutrition label as part of your bigger label. So I tell people, if you are thinking about making a nutrition label claim, you may want to think again. That is something that you really want to think through pretty hard before you start making any sort of claims like that. So this is um, a resource from the FDA, just more information about food label, nu nutrition, and nutrition, nutrient label claims, anything like that that you may, if you're thinking about doing something like this, this is a good resource to read through to give you some more information. Some other labels and claims um, are, are really programs that you can participate in here in Virginia. If you don't already know about these, are Virginia Grown and Virginia's Finest. Um, and these are great programs to participate in. And I would highly encourage you to look up both of these programs. These are programs through VDAX, and they're, they're really great programs to, to participate in. And that is all that I have. 
Yep. So when I, I'm going to send um, this, a, a folder, it's going to be a Google Drive folder with a bunch of resources to Mary and it's going to have an evaluation um, and all of these resources. And then she, I think, will send it out later on today or tomorrow. Thank you, Sarah. This is Kim Hutchinson. I appreciate so much the fascinating presentation that you made. All of the documents will be forwarded out to you um, via email as we have in the past, as well as the information will be posted on our website. Don't hesitate to reach out to either myself or Mary Delicate. Um, again, I cannot thank you enough, Sarah, for the presentation, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Any last questions before we sign off? No? All right. Well, thank you all. We will talk with you next Monday. Take care. Bye.